has a list. I'm good. I'll do it too. We're good. Before I go. Hello, everybody. Hey. I'm uh, Patrick Foster. I don't know if I'm introduced in here. Um, from the Department of Environmental Conservation, and we're gonna go ahead and start off um, this afternoon. With a quorum being present, I now call to order the December 1st, 2022 meeting of the Hudson River Park Trust Board of Directors. Please note that the meeting is being recorded and the video will be posted on the trust website and its stenographer will provide a transcript of the meeting. The directors have received the agenda materials in advance of this meeting and are free to ask questions or comment at any time on the action items submitted for approval today. Please note, however, questions or comments from the audience will not be entertained at this meeting. I note that the board memos and resolutions on today's agenda have been posted on the trust website in the link entitled Board Meetings, Bylaws, and Other Materials under Board Agendas and Minutes, and thus are available to the public. There are four items on the consent agenda. One, approval of minutes and ratification of the actions taken at the September 29th, 2022 meeting of the Hudson River Park Trust Board of Directors. Two, authorization to extend contract terms with James Corner Field Operations and Gilbane Building Company for professional services. Three, authorization to extend contract term with Wilson Conservation LLC for conservation of private passage sculpture. And four, authorization to amend contracts with Carter, Ledyard, and Milburn LLP and Cy Paget and Rizal PC for legal services. I also see that Deputy Mayor Joshi has just arrived, and so I may pass the torch over to her. Okay. Unless anyone, we'll keep rolling along. Unless anyone has any comments, I will now call for a motion to approve all of the items on the consent agenda. So moved. Second. Great. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? The motion is approved. The first corporate action before the board is authorization to contract with Pioneer Landscaping and Asphalt Paving Inc. for parkwide asphalt pavement repairs and on-call paving services. Ms. Doyle. Thank you. Asphalt paving repairs are currently required at Pier 40 and in the driveway area between Piers 81 and 83. Additional asphalt repairs at other locations will likely be identified in the future, and the trust therefore has a need for on-call caving contractor to provide such services in a timely fashion. In accordance with the trust procurement guidelines, the trust released an RFP for an on-call pavement services on August 5th and received four proposals on the submission deadline of September 1st, 2022. A selection committee comprised of trust staff reviewed the submissions and evaluated each according to the selection criteria in the RFP and then interviewed Pioneer Landscaping and Asphalt Paving Inc. Trust staff has since identified Pioneer as the highest rate proposer, which also offered the, the best value and the lowest fee for the specific projects at Piers 40, 81, and 83 at $339,000. Pioneer has completed projects for various agencies throughout the city and state, including for the New York City Department of Parks and Recreation and Department of Design and Construction and for New York State Parks. Pioneer is currently the trust contractor for the tennis court reconstruction and their performance has been satisfactory to date. Given the limited opportunity for subcontracting, the trust received approval for a waiver of the 30% MWBE subcontracting goals from New York State and the trust also issued a waiver of the 6% SDVOB subcontracting goal prior to the release of the RFP. The proposed contract will have a term of three years with an option to extend for an additional two years at the trust discretion. Trust staff therefore requests board authorization to enter into a contract with Pioneer Landscaping and Asphalt Paving Inc. for a park-wide asphalt pavement repairs and on-call paving services in the amount of $750,000 plus a 10% contingency for a total board authorization amount of up to $825,000. Funding for this contract will be identified through the capital maintenance portion of the trust annual operating budget as approved by the board each year. Sufficient funding is available in the current budget for work anticipated to be undertaken in the balance of this year. Any questions or comments? 
None. Um, so I'll call for a motion to authorize the trust and contract with Pioneer Landscaping and Asphalt Paving Inc. for parklight asphalt pavement repairs and on call paving services. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? None. The motion is approved. The second corporate action item before the board is authorization to contract with Structural Preservation Systems, LLC, for Pier 40 second floor vehicle guardrails project. Parking at Pier 40 is one of Hudson River Park's principal revenue sources. Over the years, the trust has repaired roof sections, lighting, and other systems needed to preserve the essential revenue source as the trust continues to explore the long-term future options for this pier. Over the past year, the trust restored another large section of the Pier 40 roof, reintroducing parking below that area now that it is again structurally sound. In the course of undertaking this work, staff recognized a need for additional improvements to ensure the continued ability to operate the garage safely. Specifically, staff identified the need for repairs to the 60-year-old concrete slabs on the perimeter of the second floor, along with the installation of a new steel vehicular guardrail system. The trust released an RFP for such work on October 12, 2022, and 21 companies requested a copy of the RFP. While six companies also attended the walkthrough at the Pier 40 worksite, the trust only received one timely and complete proposal from Structural Preservation Systems, or SPS, on the November 9th submission deadline, and thus, pursuant to the trust procurement guidelines, the RFP has failed. Pursuant to the procurement guidelines, staff has determined that it is in the trust's best interest to convert the failed RFP to a single source procurement. In a single source procurement, the trust must document the circumstances leading to the selection of the contractor, including the alternatives considered, the rationale for selecting the specific contractor, and the basis upon which it determined the cost was reasonable. As noted in more detail in the board memo, the trust does not believe that issuing a new RFP would result in a different outcome given the number of contractors that received a copy of the RFP and participated in later stages of the procurement process but chose not to submit an actual proposal. Moreover, undertaking a new RFP process would delay completion of the repairs and guardrail installation work, both of which are recommended to ensure the garage's continued safe operations. SPS has successfully completed competitively procured structural repair work at Pier 40 and has completed similar work at publicly owned and operated parking garages within New York State. Finally, staff believes that the proposed price for the scope of work is fair and reasonable, as the proposed price of $1.77 million is below that of both the detailed cost estimate prepared by the trust chief engineer and the assessment of the external design engineer. SPS is expected to meet the trust's 30% MWBE subcontracting goal, the 6% SDVOB goal was waived prior to release of the RFP. Trust staff therefore request board authorization to contract with Structural Preservation Systems LLC for Pier 40 second floor vehicle guardrails in an amount not to exceed $1,772,600 plus a 10% contingency for a total board authorized amount of up to $1,949,860. Funding for this contract is available from the trust capital maintenance budget with funding available from the sale of Pier 40 transferable development rights. Any questions or comments? If not, I will move, uh, call for a motion to authorize the trust to contract with, which, sorry. Um, call for a motion to authorize the trust to contract with Structural Preservation Systems, LLC, for Pier 40 second floor vehicle guardrails project. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? None. Abstentions? None. The motion is approved. The third? Can I just money from the ARS? Yes, that's what we are using the excess at our remaining ARS money. The third corporate action item before the board is authorization to contract with Carrier Communications Inc. for the park-wide security camera expansion project. The trust uses a security camera system to enhance public safety, deter crime, and help protect property. The cameras are actively monitored by the trust contracted PEP officers, and access is also provided to NYPD. 
Trust staff has identified the need for supplemental coverage at 14 additional sites. Additionally, one of the original antennas needed for the camera signal relay to Pier 40 requires an upgrade to increase bandwidth and allow for future network expansion. In accordance with the trust procurement guidelines, the trust may utilize centralized contracts created through either the state's Office of General Services or the U.S. General Services Administration. Users of centralized contracting system benefit from the collective buying power of the state or federal government. Carrier Communications, as an OGS centralized contractor, offers cameras, equipment, and installation services to meet the trust needs at a price the trust has determined to be favorable. Carrier Communications has a proven track record of successfully working with the trust through its installation of other cameras and equipment throughout the park. Carrier Communications has the lowest labor rates compared to other qualified OGS vendors, and thus has offered to provide the trust with more competitive pricing as compared to other security camera vendors on the OGS list. The trust has been very pleased with carrier communication services provided to date. The trust staff therefore requests board authorization to contract with Ca Carrier Communications Corporation for the Parkwide Security Camera Expansion Project for up to a two year term in a total board authorization amount of up to $351,000. Funding for this contract is available through the trust operating budget as approved by the board. Yes? Does the NYPD use those cameras? Like when we have those unfortunate incidents in the park, do they go back to those, those tapes? They do. Uh, we worked with them for quite a while, and this was successfully completed this fall, actually, to, so that they can directly access that footage uh, as part of the Lower Manhattan Security Initiative, but they frequently also when something happens quickly, just come straight to our offices and we provide access, obviously. Does the city give us any money toward that? Or does NYPD give us any money toward that? We do not get NYPD money directly for this. Um, we have had instances in the earlier years of this camera project where we um, received uh, funding, discretionary funding from elected officials, which we have sought and successfully gotten from time to time. So. Uh, we do ask council members, for example, for this type of thing. So, Reen, I think you said that the park staff had identified the 14 locations. Is that done in conjunction with PEP or NYPD? Uh, we do obviously work with PEP on that. NYPD, I think, sometimes is looking, and I'm going to look at Chris McCann as well. He's our senior director of public safety. NYPD um, and Chris work together very frequently. Chris is a retired police officer himself. And I think that this is done um, when there are incidents or places where we want to look more closely at. I think we are always looking at what angles, what places, our blind spots, etc. cetera. Um, but I don't think they actually tell us where they need them. Is that correct, Chris? That's correct. And I, I understand that the, the footage is there then for looking at incidents after the fact. Is, is there a real-time monitoring as well? And if we're adding 14 more feeds, does that affect our pet contract? All good questions. We have so many cameras at this point, we already have 197 cameras. We cannot always watch 197 cameras. As Chris is the first to say, cameras are a piece of policing, but are not in themselves going to stop crime. Um, at the moment, we are looking at expanding the park next year. We are looking at opportunities to change um, or to increase our coverage um, with the PEP contract. The PEP contract comes to you annually in the March meeting, I think. And thus far, we have been amending the original, original, original PEP contract, which is about Amendment 21, I think, right now. Amendment 20, something like that. We um, have talked with the Parks Department about the possibility of, of just doing it as a new contract, but we are not very far along. But I do expect that with Growing Park, at the minimum, we will need more coverage. Great. Right. All right, I'll volunteer Are there any additional questions or comments? Nope. Okay. I will call yeah, for a motion. Sorry, can I just say that the one thing, Michael, I, I don't think I answered was that we do use them in real time, though, for other purposes, too. So they are very valuable as a tool to take a look at, for example, big crowds. 
and after there's a big crowd, even something like the Wine and Food Festival, how might we have better managed vehicle circulation or pedestrian access to something like that? So they provide purposes beyond policing. Yeah, so now I will call for a motion to authorize the trust to contract with Carrier Communications Inc. for the parkwide security camera expansion project. So moved. Second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? The motion is approved. The fourth corporate action before the board is authorization to amend the contracts with the New York Engineers PC and the Pace Companies New York Inc. for Pier 40 fire sprinkler restoration, Ms. Doyle. The directors have received two separate board memos for the New York engineers and case contract amendments, but I will introduce the two memos together as they are related. Pier 40's fire alarm and fire pump systems were substantially damaged during Hurricane Sandy and were sub sub subsequently repaired. Separately, the trust began implementing repairs to the original Pier 40 fire sprinkler standpipe distribution network. While this system was not directly damaged during Sandy, the system required repairs, upgrades, and restorations. Thus, at its September 29th and December 15th, 2016 meetings, the board approved the trust entering into a contract with New York engineers to serve as the engineer of record for the Pier 40 sprinkler restoration at a total board authorization amount of up to $913,932. Thereafter, the trust separately awarded a construction contract for the related sprinkler work to the Pace Companies of New York, Inc., for a scope of work generally consisting of cleaning and honing the existing system inclusive of both mains and branch piping, replacing select components only where needed, and pressure testing the restored system. The initial contract amount authorized for Pace was up to $3,630,000 as awarded at the board's June 8, 2017 meeting and the board subsequently authorized amendments at both the November 20th, 20, 2019 and March 20th, 2020 board meetings, bringing the total board authorization amount for PACE to $5,555,955. Such amendments were needed to replace additional lengths of piping, install heating elements, and to conduct additional tests. Separately, the board also approved an amendment for the engineering contract with New York engineers by an additional $85,000 at the November 2019 meeting. For both engineering services and construction, the project strategy since contract inception has focused on identifying defective components and replacing them only as needed, while retaining components that were still believed to be in functional condition. At this point, approximately one quarter of the original system components have been upgraded with new pipes. The previously contracted work has all been satisfactorily completed, and newly constructed components will remain in service for the foreseeable future. There are still defects within the remaining components of the building's 60-year-old sprinkler system. Reluctantly, staff and New York engineers have now concluded that the balance of the original 60-year-old system should also be replaced. Therefore, trust staff now seeks to task New York engineers with design and associated permitting services required to fully inspect all aspects of the existing system, inclusive of the piping, alarms, and booster systems, as well as replacing the older branch piping that has not yet been replaced. The trust procurement guidelines require that the trust make a determination as to why employing a new competitive process is not in our best interest when the increased amendment amount exceeds 20% of the original total board authorized amount. New York Engineers has extensive history with and knowledge of Pier 40 sprinkler system, having inspected, engineered, and overseen tests and replacement of the system components over a multi-year period. Additionally, a new firm would be professionally obligated to fully inspect all recent work in order to complete its own independent analysis and drawings, resulting in additional costs. It is thus more cost-effective to have the same engineering firm supplement its existing drawings. The hourly rates plus multipliers proposed by New York engineers for its services are the same as those approved in previous years for this contract, which after several years of inflation and cost escalation in the marketplace is an additional value for the trust. Once designs have been prepared, the trust would bid the construction. In the meantime, staff recommends retaining PACE to provide on-call repair services as needed to keep the fire suppression system in a state of good repair. The trust has estimated a not to exceed limit of $200,000 for these on-call services through November 1st, 2023. 
As has been its practice while work on the sprinkler system occurs, the trust will, of course, continue to maintain the fire watch service at Pier 40 until the entire system is fully operational and all fire department sign-offs are secured. The trust therefore requests that the board approve two separate resolutions. First, to amend the contract with New York Engineers PC for an additional $423,950 plus a 10% contingency for a total board authorization amount of up to $1,465,277. And second, to amend the contract with the Pace Companies New York Inc. for Pier 40 sprinkler restoration for an additional $200,000 for a total board authorization amount of up to $5,755,955 and to extend the term of the contract through and including November 1st, 2023. Funding for these two amendments is currently available through the Trust's approved capital maintenance budget with funding available from the sale of Pier 40 transferable development rights. Thank you. Um, questions? Uh, we don't yet have the price for so this the. Is just the plan. Correct. Okay. Yes. Even though the. So what does Pace do versus the engineering? Pace has been implementing the repair program to date. We would like to add, what did I say, two hundred thousand dollars to their amount to enable them to keep making as needed repairs so while we engineer the new work, and then no doubt have a very big bill for replacements. So there's a big bill. Yes. 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 Okay. Yes. Okay. yes. Okay. Or, or from the, well, the company that wins the return. Yes. And that's not FEMA eligible. No, um, we did get roughly six million dollars. I'm looking at Owen Davies for two other fire-related um, projects at Pier 40 that were implemented at the time, including a new pump, a very powerful pump. But this system was not damaged during FEMA, and you'll hear from my FEMA report that unless it was directly damaged um, as a result of Sandy, we couldn't um, make the claim. So it was not eligible. Well, you know, we are still obviously looking for the long-term answer for Pier 40, but we are still, the investments in the pier, including the roof, have increased, as we discussed last year with the, with the Finance Committee, the parking revenue in the meantime, and it still remains a major revenue source for us. So this is, for example, covers the area where the garage spaces are. Exactly. So, uh, in fact, the because of the work we just completed and because of very, very successful management by our staff, uh, we've increased the revenue from parking at Pier 40 in this calendar year by about $2 million. I know nothing about building one of these systems. It just feels like a lot of money for mm -hmm. As an engineer that worked on the pier a long time ago put it, at Pier 40 scale, which is 800 feet by 800 feet, even paint is really expensive. Okay. It's a 15 acre pier. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, there's a donut, but it's, it's a very big place. I moaned about the same thing. I remember when I was like, do we really just spend that money on the roof? And Maureen's like, yeah, it's a three acre roof. You can't really, you think of a roof as a soccer piece, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, so. yeah. Wah, wah. <laughs> Two million dollars. <laughs> Woo! So a call for a motion authorizing the two resolutions before the directors relating to Pier 40 fire sprinkler restoration, the amendment to contract with New York Engineers PC, and the amendment to the contract with the Pace Company of New York Inc. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And abstentions? None. So the motion to approve. 
approve the two amendments is approved. The fifth corporate action for the board is authorization to amend the contract with Telco Construction Inc. for Pier 97 Park General Construction. And it's June 3rd, 2021, meaning the board authorized the trust to enter into a contract with Calco Construction Inc. for the general construction of Pier 97, which includes construction of a distinctive new playground, multi-purpose activity field, flexible gathering space, sun lawn, belvedere, overlook, sunset deck, paved pathways, and plantings. Separately, a federally funded New York State DOT administered TAP grant has been secured to construct the bikeway and esplanade area generally between West 57th and 59th streets and to connect with the southern entrance of Riverside Park South. The TAP grant process requires New York State DOT to adhere to federal requirements related to securing approval of these elements prior to the trust being authorized to procure the construction contractor for such work. As a result, the bikeway and walkway work will lag behind the pier and building work by at least one year. To ensure that a portion of the Esplanade work is fully completed at the time Pier 97 opens to the public in late summer 2023, trust staff recommends adding a portion of the Esplanade work located immediately adjacent to Pier 97 to Kelco's current Pier 97 scope of work. This work also includes procuring and installing additional foam fill for grading and installation of the permanent utilities east of the new restroom building. The remainder of the bikeway and esplanade work would be completed by a construction contractor secured through a separate competitive procurement process once the design and other required documents for the TAP grant are approved by New York State DOT. Trust staff therefore requests authorization by the board to amend the contract with Calco Construction Inc for Pier 97 general construction by an additional $1,300,000 for a total board authorized amount of up to $24,429,670. Funding for this contract is available from the trust restricted funds from the sale of transferable development rights within Community Board 4 in 2019. When the TAP grant is finally approved by New York State DOT, will we be reimbursed this money or yeah. will we spend it now it's gone? Correct. Yeah, we do think it's the right thing to do though, asking people to walk on a inadequate esplanade to a brand new pier and public bathroom, etc. does not feel appropriate. September 2019 meeting, the board authorized the trust to enter into a contract with Abel Bates and Butts for the design of Chelsea Waterside Park Phase 2 for a total board authorization amount of up to $954,946. The initial scope of work included the design of a comfort station, dog run, and picnic area and other adjacent park areas. In years 2020 and 2021, the board authorized further amendments to the contract including adding funding for the reconstruction of the synthetic turf field due to the receipt of additional New York City discretionary funding and extending the contract term. Separately, at its December 2020 meeting, the board authorized the trust to enter into a two-year contract with DAC Consulting Solutions for construction management services for a total board authorization amount of up to $1,210,000. As explained to the directors at the July 2022 board meeting, during the course of construction, numerous substantial subsurface obstructions were encountered on site, resulting in delays to the originally anticipated schedule and the need for additional design services. As a result, the trust staff requests authorization to add an additional $50,000 to the ABB contract to cover the required additional design services and an additional $300,000 and an extension of the contract term for DAX construction management services. While the increase to the DAC contract is over 20% of the original contract amount, it would not be advantageous at this time for the trust to undertake a new competitive procurement process, as bringing any other firm into the project to serve as the construction manager would require a large learning curve and additional funds, and would also delay the reopening of the remaining improved park areas to the public. 
Jack is a New York State certified MWBE firm and has performed satisfactorily on the contract to date. Trust staff therefore requests that the board authorize two separate resolutions. First, to amend the contract with Abel Baines and Betts, LLP, for Chelsea Waterside Park Phase Two design services by an additional amount of $50,000 for a total board authorized amount of up to $1,193,055. And second, to amend the contract with Jack Consulting Solutions, Inc., for Chelsea Waterside Park Phase Two construction management services by an additional amount of $300,000 for a total board authorized amount of up to $1,510,000 and to extend the term of the contract by one year. Funding for these two amendments is available from the trust capital maintenance budget using restricted funds generated from the sale of air rights in Manhattan Community Board 4 in 2019. Questions, comments? Um, when was the last time the wall field and surface was replaced in class. It seems to me that it was done relatively recently. Or um, just, is yeah. everything just all merging together at this point? I think roughly that, I mean, I think, I would say it's probably at least 10 years ago. Um, Christine Quinn, I believe, may have given us money okay. at that time, so, so that's, that's perspective, right? Yeah. right? script a little bit to keep things moving and then I'll return to script in a bit. But um, can everyone see a screen? Roll and Tam, are you able to see this? Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay, great. So let's go to the next one. It was a couple of months later than we had hoped for, but we were able to open the Chelsea Waterside Park Phase 2 dog run on November 21st, just before Thanksgiving. Um, Kevin Quinn who is our senior, uh, senior VP of Design and Construction, but also our reporter at large, um, caught the gentleman at the right with his dog, Tuffy, first customers for the dog run. Um, we still have a few finishing touches to do on the dog run. We had some fabrication of fence issues due to COVID and due to uh, supply chain issues but we decided that it was important to open the dog run anyway in the meantime, and it's always wonderful to see happy dogs, happy people. It's being used extensively because I hear the dogs all day long. Yeah. <laughs> Unlike some of your neighbors, you're not complaining, right? I'm not complaining at all, it's great, but I hear them. Good. Um, elsewhere at Chelsea Waterside, Alpine um, and the site uh, landscape contractor are making Tremendous progress on other elements of this as well. On the left, you see the new ball field preparation. They removed the old synthetic turf field, they're removing fences. Um, you know, we have the central picnic area that is also under construction to the right. And on the next picture, you can see the comfort station um, making really terrific progress. We've got solar panels, and we've even got tiling as of November happening inside the restroom facilities. We're also going well at Gansevoort. That may be the first time most of you have seen that type of angle. This is again a five and a half acre site and that's the fire department um, at the top right there. Um, we are um, working away, there are about 11 contracts that were approved for everything at the Gansevoort Peninsula, so there is a lot of coordination of construction trailers and everything else happening, but let's go to the next picture. On the north side, we are building a salt marsh that is basically installed. It's planted at this point. The balconies have been poured. The 13th Avenue promenade is pretty much finished. On the south side, the stone ledges and the kayak access ramp are also pretty much installed. Certainly all of the in-water portions are done. And this week, we put in the first grass, which is an incredibly exciting moment when you are at a park. That's the pine grove that you see on the right as well. And that is the park building. Again, it's a comfort station, a park maintenance area, and a small walk-up concession area. Pier 97 is our other big project. 
that is at 57th Street, and the big news uh, since we last met is that the trees have started going in. Also a happy moment. All of the gravit that was produced off-site is now on-site and is being installed. It looks terrific. Um, the concrete formwork is happening. We are bedding furniture mock-ups. The tennis courts, just south of Pier 40, we have pretty much finished that project except for some weather-sensitive work. So we are doing this in two different phases. Uh, we will put asphalt and temporary striping on so that we can reopen it now, and then the final color coat, seal coating will happen in the spring um, when we have better weather. We have new neighbors, um, almost, at 550 Washington. Um, that is the new Google building. And um, there was a crosswalk that was planned as part of that project. So um, we had to modify the landscape of the park as well as the actual crosswalk through the highway. And that project is now complete, except for waiting for Con Edison, apparently, to turn the light signal on. I'm sure Daniel is interested in that. I think they're thinking next week at some point. Yeah. yeah, so the city bike dock is going to return uh, to the area on the left-hand side of the photo there, and the right-hand side will be the walkway portion of it. We sized it. There's, well, the, on purpose, we are trying not to encourage everybody to just ride their bikes on the Esplanade, et cetera. So we've scaled that, but the planters can be moved if necessary. And then we have our science player. You approved the contract at the last board meeting. Uh, it was executed, and we are planning a chili groundbreaking ceremony on December 14th at 11 a.m. We would like the opportunity to thank Hudson River Park friends, all the donors, Mike Novogratz, um, our elected officials for giving money. So um, put your winter coats on and come join us. We'll send an invite out. A couple of updates on uh, the final public programs that took place in the fall. Just before the last board meeting, we had our Submerged Marine Science Festival. This year we did it as a two-day event in person. The first day was a day devoted to students. We had a 1,000 students from four boroughs. We were not able to entice Staten Island, but 75% of the students who attended were from Title I eligible um, schools. So schools where um, free lunches are available. Um, the second day was a general festival for the general public. We had about 4,000 people coming. It was spectacular. Many of our partners at this table and otherwise were there. Um, Eric, you can see Marsha P. Johnson State Park in that flyer right there, in the back of it. So, I mean, DEC, City Parks, State Parks, um, many of our nonprofit partners all participate in this, and it's a really fantastic event. And then we had our release of the fishes event from the Pier 40 Wet Lab, where we had about 300 people come, including our new council member, Chris Marte, on the top right there, releasing fish that are temporarily hosted in our wet lab back into the river, and then we, 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 we welcome them back in the spring. The same weekend as Submerge, a couple of piers away, we were hosting the New York City Wine and Food Festival, which is an enormous event requiring a lot of effort, but the, um, that event, um, all the proceeds go for God's Love We Deliver and food hunger-related causes, and it's a, it's a very popular event, and I hope some of you were able to enjoy some good eats that day. And then, of course, we had Pumpkin Smash. Uh, people came out. Uh, we had our largest crowd ever for Pumpkin Smash. Um, we had about 700 people smashing pumpkins and 2,500 pounds of smashed pumpkin to add to our compost. <laughs> I'm going to go back to script here for a, a, a bit here. Um, as promised at the last board meeting, earlier this week, the Trust hosted a meeting with the Research and Habitat Enhancement Committee of its TAC for the Sanctuary Management Plan to discuss discharges. We invited guests from Con Edison, New York State DEC, and Columbia University of Notre Dame to share context, context data, and modeling related to Pier 98 discharges, thermal discharges more broadly, and CSOs. 
Dr. Wade McGillis, a professor of civil and environmental engineering who worked with us two years ago to help create the CSO risk model that's hosted on our website, providing context on opportunities and limitations in modeling. TAC members from the Hudson River Foundation, Harbor Estuary Program, Riverkeeper, and others explored the scale and potential consequences of unique discharge sources and types. The TAC agreed that priorities for next steps should include looking at existing data that is already being collected within the sanctuary water, and then to consider what additional metrics would help the science community better understand the relationship between discharges and river temperatures. Finally, we continue to work diligently at expanding collaboration with CUNY generally, but also specifically with the two campuses closest to the park, Lower Manhattan Community College in Tribeca and John Jay College in Hell's Kitchen. Last week, we joined BMCC's Director of Research Programs in facilitating a conversation with 15 faculty members representing both social and natural science departments to share more information about the park's research projects, sustainability efforts, and ways for students to engage in the park. We'll soon be speaking with BMCC's Director of Internships and Experiential Learning to plan ways to connect more BMCC students with credit and paid job training opportunities in the park. And we've begun the process of building some similar connections at John Jay College. If anyone knows anyone there, we welcome access. Um, any, I should pause for any questions on anything that I've said so far. Okay. The trust released a request for proposals for boathouse operators at piers 26, 66, 84, and 96 on October 18th and received seven proposals on the submission deadline of November 29th, 2022. Trust staff will be reviewing the proposals with the goal of making a selection for each boathouse by the end of the year. The goal of the RFP is to provide the public with consistent, safe, and affordable access to the Hudson River while satisfying the burning interests of a wide range of users. The Trust recently met with Community Board 1 to explain the goal of the RFP, including why the Trust must undertake a request for proposal competitive procurement process for any long-term use of Hudson River Park property, and we'll be discussing the RFP at the upcoming Advisory Council meeting as well. At the last board meeting, we discussed some of the safety and security issues we've been having at the, field, at the Pier 40 fields, and Daniel Miller shared some of the experiences of DUSK, one of our youth sports leagues. Before that meeting and since then, we've been working with DESK and other leagues to be proactive to address the thefts of backpacks and scooters and have been educating our users about the importance of not leaving property unattended, which can create an attractive environment for thieves and other wrongdoers. We've identified two suspects who appear to be responsible for most of the thefts, and the trust is working closely with the six precinct detective squad. On October 11th, NYPD arrested one individual and charged him with six separate grand larcenies. Trust and PEP staff now also regularly canvass the fields and speak with field users who have left their belongings far away and out of sight about securing their property. Now I'd like to take a moment to address the three serious and horrific incidents that have taken place in the park this year. One was the overnight murder of a sleeping homeless individual by someone who also stabbed two other homeless people at other city locations and who has since been apprehended. The other two were sexual assaults, again committed by a serial assailant of two women who were jogging in the park in the early morning hours and attacked from behind. The first of these incidents took place on March 27th and the second on November 3rd. In between, the person assaulted another woman on the east side. Our hearts go out to all these victims and we're grateful that the perpetrator was caught. Camera footage provided by HRPT after the first assault helped NYPD identify the suspect in early spring and the police had been searching for him until hours after the most recent incident when he was caught attempting to flee the city. I know we all believe that the safety of our patrons and staff must be our highest priority and we know that these incidents, while tragic, are outliers. Statistically, the park is a very safe place, and the number of people running and recreating here, including when it's dark outside, is a testament to that. A great deal of care has gone into thinking about design, lighting, upkeep, water safety equipment, our growing camera system, coordination with NYPD and other government agencies, communications with tenants, and our advisory council. And certainly, our PEP contract and officers all work together to create and sustain this atmosphere but we're always looking for ways we can do more, particularly after such alarming incidents. 
During the summer, we conducted a lighting survey and have tasked one of our on-call landscape designers with designing some supplemental lighting in certain locations. As you know, you've just approved installation of additional cameras. And while they don't themselves stop crime, they can help deter it and clearly support police efforts. Thanks to a recent conversation with our Advisory Council Safety Committee, we are promoting a safety campaign with safe running recommendations from New York Roadrunners at multiple locations and on social media. Hudson River Park feels like its own place in some ways. It's separated by a highway and has many individual peers, each with its own personality and uses, but also clearly part of a larger city. To that end, we obviously also work closely with, with the city, most especially with NYPD, on enforcement and safety strategies. And I'm happy to say that our relationship with NYPD has grown stronger over the past few years in particular. Of course, I and other staff are always available to listen to any additional ideas on how to improve safety in the park. I should pause here. Does anyone have any questions or anything that I haven't specifically tried to anticipate? Yeah, I think that that is a factor. I mean, technically, some of these times the park is closed. And yet, we are four miles long, dozens of piers, dozens of crosswalks, operating businesses, and a straight pathway next to a bikeway that is always open because it's a highway component. So, in fact, you know, our, we have certain places with gates and barriers and locks, like playgrounds and still sometimes people scale things, but you know, there are places that actually have locks and then otherwise we don't have gates. And um, it's a pretty porous park. Right, but do the lights go out at one? No, we have some lights that stay on. We do turn off some sports field lights and other things like that, both for environmental reasons and energy reasons and we would bother our neighbors, I think. Right. So we're building out the camera system. We're gonna have, I guess, over 200 cameras. There is the light. What are the uh, what are the other things that we're doing? To, and it, it's unfortunate because I think all the incidents we've discussed here are serial criminals, and we just have to be the location. So there are other things out there that we should be doing. I assume we're talking about Mike Stadium, and, and we have other kinds of things. Are there things we should be thinking about? Yeah, I mean, a piece of it, we, we are already, I believe, Commissioner may know, um, one, the only park um, that is not a city park that contracts with PEP for 24-hour coverage. Um, so we already do take that measure to have PEP on site even when the park is technically closed. Um, but we have so many peers that no number of police or PEP officers is going to be sufficient to cover every spot all the time. And if we did, it would feel like a police state and no one would want to recreate here. So I think while we, we did just discuss increasing the number of PEP officers um, potentially, or um, potentially looking at supplementing that with some, maybe it makes sense for some private security in some places, not all places. We use PEP for a very definite reason. They signal park, um, they're peace officers, they don't carry guns, um, and it's consistent with what our customers and using other parks would have. But there may be places where some private security might make sense in certain circumstances. So we are starting to look at things like that as we have in the past. Um, sight lines, things like that are a, a, a piece of how safety is addressed. Um, our trees mature, branches grow, um, things like that. You know, that's something that we're looking closely at as well, whether we need to um, trim some things, and the lighting survey that I have talked about. Um, we do think that there are places where some supplemental lighting um, could be both a deterrent, but also just um, help people feel just more visible. Um, open to other ideas of any sort, really. Um, again, Chris McCann, um, I know, would be happy to speak with any of you, Rob Rodriguez as well, me anybody. But, uh, you know, I think this is just something that we 
are always incident or not. It's our job to always look at what we can do to make the parks as safe as it can be. Okay. Uh, I just ask one question. Yeah. As a, as a newer person here, what is your year over year statistics? Um, we have. I brought this actually. Um, we track um, incidents of many sorts. Um, this year, in terms of uh, types of things that are considered major crime, which also includes things like petty larceny, um, we have a total of, um, well, let's, I should see. Um, like this year, we had one murder. Last year, we had no murders. You know, it's, it's typically numbers like that that we're looking at, one to none. Um, to to one something like that. Not all increases; some of them are decreases. Um, so we look at hate crimes, we look at sexual assaults, we look at burglary, we look at robbery, and the numbers are very very low overall. Um, and we look at them in comparison with what's happening in the four adjacent precincts: the first, the sixth, the tenth, Midtown North. Um, and as you would expect, we are way less than any of those as a standalone place. So I do feel that it is entirely truthful and accurate that we are a very, very safe place, but one is too many, you know, when something terrible happens. I, I recognize that comparing it to other parks is not totally useful because each of them are unique, but do we compare ourselves to other parks? Do we have any sort of basis of to say that we are a safe park, a safer park than others, safer than most? We just reinstituted what we call our safety roundtable, where we've uh, invited a lot of different park partners to join us in talking about everything from, I don't know, um, policing practices to life rings to all kinds of things. So that is something that I think we could directly start building towards. I think that might be beneficial for everyone. Okay, well, I remain open and available for any observations in this round. And um, I'll shift topics fairly radically to the insurance topic. Um, but I do have some good news on that. Um, we, our general liability insurance renewal took place today, December 1st. And for the next year, we've actually been able to reduce the cost of our liability insurance by approximately $1.2 million. Last year's premium was 6.4 million, and the new current premium is approximately 5.2 million. As you're aware, the, state, the act, the Hudson River Park Act, requires the state and city to pay for this cost, with the state paying 65% and the city paying 35% based on their respective areas of the park. Separately, our commercial property coverage was also renewed as of today, and the premium for that coverage is $170,000, which is about $14,000 higher than last year which the trust pays out of its operating budget. I'd like to thank OGS, our insurance broker, Paul Hennessy, and many staff members, including Christine Fazio and Denise Ruggiero, Kevin Quinn, Kate O'Malley, others for the work they do all year long on contracts, managing job sites safely, and everything else that helps keep our costs down. And in other good news, nearly 10 years to the day that Hurricane Sandy made landfall, the trust received its final reimbursement from the federal government via the state of New York for costs incurred by HRPT to restore the park. In total, the trust was reimbursed for 100% of eligible costs, totaling over $34.5 million in assistance, 90% of which was funded by the FEMA and 10% from community development block grants. Many of you were not board members at the time, so for context, while the park obviously suffered along with so much of the rest of the city and region, core infrastructure such as rebuilt piers, buildings, and our many landscapes performed well overall. The greatest amount of damage, or almost half of the overall cost, was in the realm of electricity. Repairs to mechanicals and building systems, especially at Pier 40, accounted for about 13.7 million, and various exterior park areas, including a couple of playgrounds and areas with synthetic turf, required about 3.8 million in reconstruction. The balance consisted of park cleanup and rental and repair of equipment. 
The trust recovery efforts were a joint effort. Trust staff were on hand throughout the duration of the storm and immediately afterwards, set forth in safing off areas, removing debris, cleansing planted areas with fresh water to deter damage from salt water, cataloging damages and losses. Our elected officials, particularly Congressman Nadler and Senator Horman, provided strong support in helping us access necessary federal and state financial aid, and Hudson River Park Friends helped raise money for restoring play equipment. For costs to be eligible for reimbursement, the trust was required to provide extensive documentation to FEMA proving that the damages being repaired were directly caused by the effects of Hurricane Sandy. Eligible project, projects were required to be restored to their pre-storm conditions unless current codes required improvements. To assist with the incredibly complicated reimbursement process, the trust contracted with Adjusters International, a firm with extensive experience working with government entities in obtaining the maximum repayment from FEMA. Trust staff regularly met with Adjusters International to collect and analyze documentation and to prepare submittals to New York State Department of Homeland Security and Emergency Services, or DISHES. Eventually, trust staff, in particular, Owen Davies, our VP of Management Systems, Owen, say hi, took over from Adjusters International, meeting with DISHES and FEMA regularly. Ten years later, the trust is fully reimbursed for all of its Sandy-related work, and the directors received this morning a copy of the final FEMA reimbursement memo as part of the board handouts. Needless to say, this effort has been monumental, and I would like to thank Owen especially for diligently and efficiently managing the reimbursement process over these several years to ensure that we receive every penny that we were eligible to receive. Our facilities and design and construction departments did the work of implementing most of the restoration, and Dwayne Cremona, Kevin Quinn, Kate O'Malley, Lupe Frattini, and their predecessors all deserve credit, as of course do Madeline Wills and Dan Kurtz, Sikhani Zubri, Kim Quinones. I'd also like to give a shout out to uh, two other former colleagues, Raymond Medina, who's now at New York City, and Aisha Daniel, who passed away during COVID, but she also did a lot of the work in the early phases of this. And given the Sandy update, it seems especially appropriate to update you on two proposed resiliency projects that would affect the park. As you've heard previously, the Battery Park City Authority is studying measures to protect its northern and western portions in tandem with other measures that have been previously approved. Battery Park City Authority has issued a draft scope of work related to the environmental impact statement that must be prepared and held its public scoping meeting on November 16. Rashi Puri, our AVP of real estate, attended that meeting and is leading the trust effort to assess how the project would affect Hudson River Park, including views, safety, operations, and the potential for hydrological impacts. The trust intends to provide a comment letter prior to the deadline of December 31st to ensure that the construction and operation impacts to the park are fully analyzed. The plan would require an amendment to the Hudson River Park Act to modify our southern border. That's um, the incursion is technically part of the park, our park property. Um, and uh, it could possibly affect the mooring field that is there somewhat. And to the west, a proposed flood barrier system would be installed potentially along Hudson River Park and the bikeway north of Stuyvesant High School and then crossing Route 9A at about Harrison Street. We'll share the comment letter that we intend to send to the authority with the directors later in December, and Battery Park City Authority has committed to work with us and other agencies to ensure trust input is considered during the design process. HRPT will also keep Community Board 1 and our advisory council informed as planning progresses. Separately, the United States Army Corps of Engineers has also released a Coastal Storm Risk Management Feasibility Study, which is referred to as the Draft Integrated Feasibility Report and a Tier 1 Draft Environmental Impact Statement. The study was prepared in cooperation with New York State DEC, New Jersey DEP, New York State Department of State, and the New York City Mayor's Office of Climate and Environmental Justice, and considers measures referred to as adaptation measures to manage coastal storm risk in tidally influenced regions of New York and New Jersey Harbor, including the Hudson River from New York City to Troy. Adaptation measures include storm surge gates, seawalls, flood walls, and other resiliency measures at key locations around New York City for an estimated cost of $52 billion. As relates to Hudson River Park, the plan includes a mix of flood walls, seawalls, and levees along the west side of Manhattan from 34th Street to the south, 
connecting to the planned Battery Park City Resiliency Project. It appears one of the options would be a mix of concrete flood walls and deployable barriers located along the eastern side of Route 9A bikeway and along portions of the park. Rashi Puri and Eric Lynn Salata, our chief engineer, attended an information public meeting hosted by the Army Corps on the plan, and the trust will be speaking with state and city agencies who've been involved in the planning to date prior to submitting comments on the Tier 1 draft EIS by the January 6th deadline. And we'll provide you with more information as we receive it. Regarding on that one, the Army Corps of Engineers, my understanding was they want to build a 16 foot wall along the bike path. It appears that the so two. Like 23rd Street down? That these two options here at the top um, are the types of things that could potentially be installed along the bike path given current planning. But the specific locations haven't, as I understand it, been confirmed. So whether that could shift. So there would be a 16 and a half foot wall blocking the park from the rest of the city. Really? Bravo to the Army Corps of Engineers. I think that as the Army Corps a couple of years ago had another idea, which was more the a flood barrier system or a fully flood barrier system. And almost immediately that received a ton of opposition because of uh, environmental concerns for habitat reasons. And so my understanding is that, in, and I'm no expert on this, and I don't know if anyone is, but this is the kind of thing we will learn more about from our colleagues at other government agencies. But my understanding is that um, in a NEPA or federal environmental review process, you can, you have to bring things to a certain level, this, the tier one aspect, but it isn't necessarily saying this is their preferred option yet. They already did. I think kind of the equivalent. I don't know if it got quite as far in the flood walls. I'm looking at Patrick and, and, and Deputy Mayor, but I think they have. You should see the uh, flood chart that is required for them for this. So I think there is quite a lot of considering still so happening. I went through the draft EIS. They came up with a lot of different plans, and this was their preferred plan. It's uh, bizarre. Well, the preferred plan a couple of years ago was the one that was fully. In yeah, I would just say that the, this EIS process that we're in right now is an overall sort of large scope process and that it has many, many components that have a very long timeline um, for completion. And so I think that uh, there will be other opportunities for public participation and other amendments to the EIS or new EISs that will happen for each of these projects. So we shouldn't panic yet. Do as you like. <laughs> and tell me about this. I didn't believe her because I couldn't believe that we hadn't heard of that first. And I am yeah, sure right. I did hear that preceding one. But um, I don't get how the feds have, how they even are planning for this without mobile. Well, there are. There, so the state and city are part of the planning process as well. If you can, you go back a couple of slides. Who remembers? Okay. So um, you see, these are all areas where yeah, it's a huge area. So which is that's what you're referring to. It like this EIS is, is covering this entire dotted. Oh, I see. Area. Yeah. Which also includes New Jersey. New Jersey. You see there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And we couch this as very. It's a, it's a very important step in the process to get some resiliency, I think, for our area. And um, there will likely be lots of trade offs that will ultimately have to be discussed between resiliency and other factors like access to, to the waterfront. Um, but yes, this is, this is the first large step in this very large process. As you can see, it's covering many different places. I would say each of these is like its own longer traffic negotiation. So if you take like the runways, for example, um, or Staten Island, where the Army Corps is doing work from Sandy, it's like every step of the way is a negotiation with the community on what's promenade, what's seawall, what's what's food paid for what. It's painfully slow if you'd like to see things built. But it's actually maybe not so bad that it's slow if it's the fact 
that it's going to incorporate ultimately, or it'll get stalled. We have the other three just get stalled because of the comment process as well. Um, but it is, I mean, you're, you're, I wouldn't be scared by those pictures now or even the price tag now because it is so early. But the price tag's only going to go up. Yeah, the price tag will go up, no doubt, but. Um, mm -hmm. that, there's one, there's one that Well, uh, I mean, it is sort of our money. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not fiscally responsible for that money. It's more like that just makes me sad. Right, but there are the parts of it that, like, if we want to change or add improvements or modify, then it starts to get into state and city tax dollars. So we do, you know, we do have a stake in this. They carry the bulk of the bill, but there's modifications that happen along the way where we have to. I mean, I think the one thing that I would say about this current version of it is that it would not appear to provide protection to Hudson River Park. And it's we have, over many years, basically been asked by each of the three community boards, like, what are we doing for resiliency? And because of our jigsaw configuration, we really couldn't build flood walls and things that protect Hudson River Park entirely. Maybe something in the river could theoretically do that, but that has trade-offs for other reasons that have to be really carefully considered. So, you know, our position, frankly, has always been Hudson River Park, pieces of it, whatever, may be sacrificial for a higher good, if that is what the policymakers above us determine, right? If lives and property and jobs and access or whatever are determined to be more important, we are public open space. Um, so we're also jobs and other things like that, and our job is to explain what Hudson River Park is so that decision makers, I think, have access to what this four mile stretch is. Okay, um, one last thing before I turn to Kim Pinanis for our, our required six month financial update. I just want to acknowledge our longtime staff member, many of you know him, Tom Linden. He's our VP of Marketing and Events. He's announced his retirement at the end of the year. He's got a new grandson, wants to spend more time with his family, and he's just been an incredible force for good here. He's always the first to say kind words to his colleagues, to champion the park. Um, he's brought Amex pop-up tennis courts and concerts and all kinds of good stuff to us and helped raise a lot of money for us over the years through sponsorship and other things. So um, I just want to publicly acknowledge him and thank him. He's not here today, but he deserves a shout out from us all. Sometimes that doesn't always happen. 
So I just want to let you know that the bottom line is that we are now on track. Our revenues are in a strong um, position. Total revenues right now are currently a bit ahead of budget at 61% rather than 50% at the mid-year mark. This reflects a couple things. We've got expected seasonal variations because our tenants, uh, the, the park is operating, the high point season is the summer while the uh, restaurants are open and they'll now be closed but for one or two of them. So we expect a little bit more front weighted uh, revenues. Um, but we also got a stronger than expected uh, post COVID recovery in the tourism sector. So some of our, our leases are generating more revenue than we had budgeted. We were very, very conservative when we originally budgeted, and that was kind of this point last year. So we now have good, good, good track record, let's say. Um, notably, parking continues to be a strong contributor. Lori mentioned it, and actually, we were able to um, budget 2.5 million more this year in our budget than the previous year's budget for the parking revenues. And so we are um, exactly at 50%, so we're, we're right on track on, on the parking side. On the expense side, we're a bit under budget at 45%. The variation, again, is primarily seasonal, but for different reasons. We budget more at the, at the latter end of the year because there were extra cleaning and snow removal and, and maintenance requirements that we have. Um, during this period. So on, on basically on the whole, we're on track for our projected operating surplus and whether or not we go to some small operating deficit which we fund from our trust reserves. Depends on how much of a capital maintenance project that we end up um, completing. I want to talk a little bit about the whole capital plan and the capital spending so far. The current year's budget has 97.6 million in new construction and capital maintenance scheduled for this year. The new construction is 67.6 million. That's two main new construction projects, Gansport and, and uh, Pier 97. They're on or under budget. Um, we did raise the Pier 97 budget slightly uh, by that Kelco contract that we just um, passed right now, but basically again, that was less than three percent. So, so we are on target with our two major construction projects. And for the current fiscal year, spending is a little bit behind pace that we expected, but again, these numbers that I presented to you are as of September 30th. We've done a lot in the last two months too, and we're, we're on track for significant spending um, through this third quarter. Um, on the capital maintenance side, uh, there was just under 30 million budgeted. Two thirds of that is reimbursable from our air rights funds or from city or state capital funding. And this includes a significant portion of the Chelsea Waterside Park Phase 2 projects and the Pier 40 projects. We've expended just over 9 million on these projects as of September 30th. And as I said, we're continuing apace through this quarter. Um, the fire sprinkler and safety rail projects that we just approved are part of capital maintenance, as so they'll be put in. Uh, some expenditure this year, but most of it next year, and that's reimbursable from air rights. Um, and some marine projects and tennis court reconstruction that we're completing in this current court quarter will raise our, our capital maintenance expenditures. So again, basically we're on track, no significant unexpected shocks, either to the upside or the downside, like a chain. Great, questions? Thank you very much. Uh, I just want to thank the trust for being so cooperative in a lot of the issues that we're coming up with and being very transparent, and I think we're making a lot of headway. Um, I actually gave you and a letter to the co-chair, but Patrick, I think you have it, and I just want to highlight most of the a lot of the meeting and a lot of the, uh, the time that was spent before the November 1st meeting, which was our last advisory council meeting, was spent on this letter. It was written by over a half dozen uh, different uh, advisory council members. 
So it really uh, went through many revisions and was uh, accepted unanimously with one abstention, which is Tom Fox of the City Club who uh, did not vote. Um, and the main points of the letter, I'll just summarize it, is that it requests that appropriate agencies and Con Ed provide additional data and resources on all discharges within the park so that the impacts of those discharges on human and ecological health are better understood and any impacts can be mitigated if necessary. Specifically, we ask that resources be identified so that the Parks Research and Habitat and Enhancement Technical Advisory Committee, subcommittee, the TAC, can work with the park staff and outside partners to develop and carry out an independent research program focused on these issues. And finally, ensure better communications about the state's permitting process going forward with a special request to DEC to eventually come to one of our meetings, knowing that there's a lot of important issues in front of us right now, uh, especially the Resiliency Project, which has all the community boards kind of asking many, many questions without a lot of answers coming forward. Um, so uh, thank you for taking a look at the letter, and I hope one day that the DEC can send someone to just explain their process to us, because a lot of it's just not understanding the information that we're receiving. Uh, secondly, we also talked about, very briefly, Pier 34. It's a northern part of the pier, where uh, right now Port Authority uh, uses it to access the, uh, the tunnel site, and we're hoping that one day we can open that up to the public. Uh, it's a long project, but it's something that we're gonna begin to uh, investigate and to come upon ideas that we'll share with Robert and Noreen. Um, very exciting, a new uh, program that we're initiating at, uh, at the Advisory Council is working with the Highline Network, and they have a toolkit that uh, introduces diversity, equity, inclusion exercises so that we can think about outside the box to bring, to make our park even more inclusive, and that's being headed by Michael Wiggins of uh, the uh, Little Island, as well as Anna, and I can't pronounce her last name, who uh, heads it up from the Highline uh, High Network. Um, we're also going to be, as Noreen talked about, uh, for our next meeting, talk about the RFP for the boathouses. You know, public water access is very important to our communities. Uh, I know the CB1 talked about it, CB2 is it's on their agenda coming up at the next Parks and Waterfront Committee, and we're going to be talking a little bit about it. Uh, we have a very active member on our board for many years, our, our council for many years, is Graham Herschel, who sends us a lot of facts about public access and keeping it free, and this is also part of the DEI uh, idea. So we want to make sure that we can get folks into the water without having to charge them any money whatsoever and to keep our food programs free, if that's at all possible. And then uh, finally, uh, we look forward to the conversation, learning more about resiliency. I know that there's several meetings on the community board level, and they're probably going to be attending our uh, Park Advisory Council meeting as well, because they do understand that the voice, the loudest voice at this point, is probably going to be coming from the trust, and we want to hear and learn and support uh, the trust and uh, the way it sees and is how its engineers see the best foot forward. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Conversation is unavailable today to present on behalf of the Hudson River Park Friends, so we'll have a longer report in January. And if there is not any further business, I'll request the directors move into executive session to discuss pending real estate transactions, litigation, and personnel matters and then we adjourn the public portion of the meeting. The executive session will not include any action items for approval by the directors. May I please have a motion to move into executive session and adjourn the public portion of this meeting. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions, the motion is approved. Thank you. The public portion of this meeting is now adjourned. The trust will now stop the recording and the director